morning. Um, my name is Deborah Ulster. I'm from the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, and I'd like to welcome you all to our first talk of the season, as it were. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. George Lowenstein. He's the Herbert A. Simon Professor of Economics and Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. He got his PhD from Yale. Um, and has held academic positions at many prestigious places, the University of Chicago, Carnegie Mellon, uh, fellowships at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the Russell Sage Foundation, and the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin. And um, he has uh, many distinguished honors, but I don't want to take away from his time because we really want to hear what he has to say, not what I have to say. Um, so with that, I will turn over the microphone. The title of his talk is Behavioral Economics, Classical Economics, Public Policy, Politics, and Health. Please help me welcome Dr. Lowenstein. Dr. Ulster invited me along time ago and asked me to come up with a title. And so I tried to come up with a title that was sufficiently expansive so I could give any talk that I wanted to give when the, t when the time came. The, and, but hopefully the talk itself is a lot um, shorter than the title, because I really um, am hoping that we'll have time for discussion. Um, OK. Uh, this is research. I'm going to be talking about research with Kevin Volpe and a number of other colleagues um, who I'm going to be acknowledging as we go along at Carnegie Mellon, Penn, Harvard, other places. It's sort of loosely, a, a better title might be um, Redesigning employee, employee Health Incentives Lessons from Behavioral Economics. This, my talk is loosely based on a forthcoming paper that we have. Okay. Um, so this is... Um, not going to be new to anybody, but health care costs in this country are out of control, much higher than in any other country in the world per capita. If you do a regression where you look at um, income, where you look at health expenditures as a function of income, you see there's a really, really nice line. Um, these are different countries with one outlier, and that is the United States. In fact, this outlier isn't even in the right place. It would have to be off the um, graph, to, um, but there's no, there's no room on the graph for the United States. Um, there's a lot of potential, potentially effective remedies for dealing with the problem of out-of-control health care costs. We could, for example, cease reimbursement of high-cost tests and procedures that are of questionable value, and that um, uh, Britain has, of course, been a leader in this area with their, with their nice uh, panel. We could eliminate easily avoidable conflicts of interest, which is another research of interest, interest of mine. We could change the compensation of doctors, minimizing fee-for-service arrangements. Probably all of these would be, uh, potentially, if they were implemented in the right way, could be effective remedies for the out-of-control health care costs. Um, None of these are part of the health care reform bill, unfortunately. Um, there's one other possible avenue of cost cutting, other than these ones that I just mentioned, and that is to change individuals' um, health behaviors. If we can only make people healthier, then we won't have to give them health care. And of course, and there is some logic to that, it's better to prevent a case of lung cancer than to treat it. So um, there is some logic to trying to change healthcare behaviors. Um, and healthcare behaviors are undeniably um, disastrous. We, of course, have an um, obesity epidemic in this country. The obesity rate um, went from 13% to 31% from 1960 to 2000. Over half of the population now is overweight. Um, it's been estimated that lifestyle diseases um, caused, for example, by tobacco, alcohol use, and obesity count for about a third of premature deaths in this country. And we do have a variety of potentially um, beneficial treatments and medications to control these lifestyle diseases and also non other types of diseases. However, the effectiveness of these medications and treatments is stymied by poor adherence. Here's um, one study by Jacobitis et al., um, which looked at the um, 
rate of statin adherence over time for different populations. And the bottom, the bottom line is people with acute um, coronary um, syndrome. And you can see that most people are, um, go, their adherence is dropping to um, about, for the, aver the average person, sorry, that would be the top line, not the bottom line. For average person, adherence is dropping to 50% after less than a year, and but even for people with acute coronary syndrome, only uh, after about two years, only half of them are taking their statins. And you'd think that they, you know, they would be highly motivated to take medications to avoid another heart attack, but they're not, strangely enough. Um, poor medication is, um, adherence is associated with um, higher rates of disease, death, increased healthcare costs. It's been estimated. Um, one estimate is $100 billion per year, the cost of poor medication adherence. And it's generally the case that um, even very effect, effect, efficacious medications um, don't have an impact if people don't take them, obviously. Okay, the health care reform bill includes several provisions aimed at changing health um, behaviors. One of them is calorie posting. It, man it, it mandates um, calorie posting. Um, at chain restaurants um, nationally. Um, I've actually done a lot of research on this and uh, many other people have. And with the exception of one study that looked at people at Starbucks, which is not exactly the target of the legislation, with the exception of that one study, all of these studies have reached similar conclusions, which is that calorie posting doesn't seem to have any impact on, beha on d eating behavior. Um, another Approach of the health care reform bill is um, value-based insurance design, Section 22713 um, of the Affordable Care Act mandates that recommended services be covered without cost sharing. And once again, this sounds like a good idea. It is the case when you raise the co-pays on services that fewer people get them. However, all of the research that I've seen, and um, quite a bit of research, um, has not found generally that when you lower copays on medication, that more people tend to take them. So VBID, as it's called, does not actually seem to be a very effective way of getting people to take their medications. Which, and this, that actually kind of relates to the general theme of my talk. And finally, the health care reform bill um, introduces provisions to condition health premiums on health behaviors. Um, the so-called um, Safeway Amendment allows for up to 50% premium adjustments based on um, outcome-based assessments, smoking, BMI, blood pressure, cholesterol. And this is called the Safeway Amendment because it's based on Safeway's claims of flat costs in the past five years from tying premiums to biometric measures. However, there's been a lot of um, challenges to Safeway's um, claims. There's a Washington Post um, article the headline is misleading claims about Safeway wellness incentives shape health care bill. Their flat if you look um, carefully, their flat costs actually preceded the intervention that they introduced. So it really doesn't make any sense to, for them to claim that their intervention caused the flat costs. Um, and in fact, beyond this um, evidence from so-called evidence from Safeway, there's amazingly little other evidence that this approach is effective this approach being the approach of conditioning premiums on these different um, health measures, behavior and other types of measures. So the, whole, the main purpose of health insurance is to redistribute burdens of illness between healthy people and sick people, kind of to, sh to share the costs of poor health, right? Um, the Safeway Amendment is going to undermine this purpose and it's going to increase premiums for low-income families and minorities who tend to have worse health behaviors. Um, and it's going to lower premiums for, people, for healthy people. And that is regressive. It's, um, and the stated purpose of the Safeway Amendment is, is to promote healthier behaviors and reduce costs. But uh, the worst possible outcome will be if the Safeway Amendment introduces greater reg regressivity. It causes poor, unhealthy people who tend to, you know, poor people tend to have, be more likely to smoke, have higher BM BMIs and so on, 
causes the exact people who can't afford the premiums to raise their premiums. And at the same time, it has little impact on behavior. That's the worst possible outcome. So what can behavioral economics contribute to this? Um, well, the train has left the station on the Safeway Amendment as part of health care reform. So uh, we can't do anything about that. Um, but a major implication of behavioral economics is that a dollar does not equal a dollar does not equal a dollar. What I mean by that is you can, there are ways of delivering incentives to people where you might as well just burn the money. Um, it's going to have no impact on people. And there are other ways of taking exactly the same incentives and making them much more effective. Um, and how premium conditioning is implemented is going to determine whether or not it changes behavior. That is, whether or not we, in addition to the re regressivity of the Safeway Amendment, we also get some benefits from it. So let me change gears for a moment and to get, leave the domain of healthcare behavior and illustrate my point with um, two different um, programs. These were designed to stimulate savings behavior among low-income people. Um, again, these are programs not in the domain of health, but I think they illustrate the general theme that I'm trying to convey. Um, so the problem is um, we have all sorts of tax-protected savings in this country, like um, IRAs, 401ks, and so on. Um, but these only give you benefits. They give you benefits to the degree that you're in a high tax bracket because they, they, give you t um, they give you tax deductions. That's only helpful to you if you're in a high income tax bracket. So poor people don't get the same, be um, same benefits for saving as rich people. And um, so there have been efforts to try to come up with programs to give poor people the same benefits that rich people um, enjoy. And two different um, programs were tested by academic researchers collaborating with H&R Block. The first one w what was, call, what was, was what was called the Savers Credit, which was enacted in 2001. In this program, um, there was a federal income tax reduction of up to 50% of funds contributed to an IRA. So if a low-income individual contributed, let's say, $100 to the IRA, their taxes would be cut by $50. So effectively, it's effectively a 100% match. You put in $100 and effectively, well, you put in $50, effectively you get $100. It's a 100% match on your savings. Solution two was a savings match, and this was tested a few years later. And in this solution, clients preparing tax returns at H&R Block offices were assigned to one of three match rates for IRA contributions. There was a control group that got no match a 20% 20 uh, 20 match group. And so every $100 they put in H&R um, block, as it appeared to them anyway, uh, put in an extra $20. And there was also a 50% 50 50 match where there was an extra, for $100 savings, it would be extra $50. So you can see solution two is considerably less generous than solution one. But let's take a look at the results the savers um, credit, the take-up rate was 3%. And among those 3%, the average um, contribution to the IRA was $587. This is with a 100% effective match. If you look at the match experiment, the control was 3% take-up rate. That is, they didn't give them anything, but 3% contri contributed to the IRA then and there. And they contributed an average of 765 now, these are two different population groups it's and two different years. So you can't do strictly compare the two. But it doesn't look um, like the saver's credit had much of an impact. Um, however, if you look at the 20% match, 8%, there's an 8% take-up rate, $1,100 conditional um, average um, contribution. And with a 50% match, it was a 14% take-up rate. So the, the point is, that these two programs, the more generous program had seemingly no impact on behavior. The less generous um, program had quite a big um, impact on behavior. And that, the point is that really matters how you implement incentives. Why the difference in the opposite direction from the objective incentives? Probably it has something to do, this is pure conjecture, that the savings, savers credit, um, the benefit was integrated 
with the income tax, and so it was not very salient to them. And second, the reduction, um, poor people don't pay a lot of income tax, but still, for them, it's a large amount. And the reduction in the amount that they paid um, was not very large compared to the amount of tax that they were paying. So the reduction was kind of amorphous to them. The match, in contrast, was separated and, more, as a result, more salient. And with the match, it feels like you're getting a gift and you're going to forego, you're going to lose the gift if you don't put the, some money aside. It's like someone's ready to give you $20 and you're going to give up the $20 if you don't put in your own $100. And so the second one is just psychologically very different, even though from an economic perspective, it's less generous. Now, most health programs ignore the most basic lessons of economics. Here's a program that's um, offered by an insurance company. It's a fitness program. It's designed to get people to um, exercise. They can get up to $150 back for joining and using the gym. It's got a picture of attractive people. Um, among other, that's, that part is probably good. That probably, part, pro probably does help people to exercise. Um, among other things, regular physical act activity can help you to reduce cholesterol. And, okay, it tells you why you should do it. And um, complete 120 workouts in 365 days, and you'll be eligible for a reimbursement of up, um, of up to $150. Well, if you wanted to burn $150, you couldn't come up with a better way of doing it. Um, this has a lot of design flaws. The rewards are once a year. There's a single high threshold. How many people are going to go to the gym 120 times? Only, probably only people who are already going to the gym 120 times. So this program is going to spend $150 on a bunch of people who were going to exercise anyway, and probably isn't going to get anybody who wasn't exercising to exercise. Um, if you look at the typical healthcare plan, this is just like the data you get. You have, like you have to make a decision between these two plans. If you look at the typical healthcare plan, I'm not going to actually go through the uh, details, but all of you know that typical healthcare plan is absolutely bewildering. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of thought went into designing that plan. There's a lot of detail. The designers of the plan wanted to incentivize the subscribers to behave in very specific ways. But after actually way more than an hour of scrutiny um, by one person with a PhD in economics, um, obviously myself, I, I, I couldn't figure out what these plans are all about. In fact, I couldn't figure out what, really what the fundamental difference be what between the two plans was or which plan I would personally choose. Um, and if you can't understand how the plans work, how could they possibly incentivize you to behave in any way? So our approach, um, Kevin and mine and our collaborators, our, our general approach is to use decision, yeah, decision errors to help people. So the same, so behavioral economics is very concerned with the kind of common decision errors that people make in day-to-day -day life. And the approach that we've been taking is to try to use the same errors that usually hurt people to instead help them. And for example, People tend to be um, very short-sighted, right? They're very oriented towards immediate costs and benefits. That's usually a bad thing. That's part of the reason why we don't save money. It's part of the reason why we gain weight, because the immediate food is very attractive to us. So, but it's possible to play on present bias preferences and, and incentive programs by making rewards for beneficial behavior very frequent and immediate. Um, Steve Higgins and his colleagues who do um, research on, with drug addicts, they do programs with drug addicts, have had remarkable success. So you take an addict, um, the addict is like living on the street, they've lost their family, they're unemployed and so on, they have every motive to kick their habit, they don't kick their habit. But you give them small coupon, coupons, good for really small rewards, like um, st at stores, and all of a sudden it has a huge impact on behavior, whereas the much, much larger impact uh, um, motivation to kick the habit and get your life together doesn't seem to work. Framing and segregating rewards, I've already talked about that. 
um, with the tail of the two tax protected um, savings programs. But a $100 reward is much more likely to be effective than a $100 discount on a health premium for many reasons. One, the $100 reward is kind of separated, and two, it's not buried in a much larger amount. People tend to overweight small probabilities, and so in a lot of re our research, as you'll see, we, tend, we often give people lottery rewards. People love lotteries in part because they exaggerate the, pro the likelihood of winning. So if people love lotteries, let's give them lottery rewards, and so on. So let me just give you um, one example. I'm not going to go through the psychology in this example in great detail, but I'm just going to use it to illustrate that in healthcare, very much like in savings for low-income families, in healthcare, how you implement a program makes a big difference. This is a um, study with um, Emily Hazley, a former graduate student, Kevin Volp, Tom P uh, Pelothy, um, and in it, um, a healthcare company it, um, headquartered in Pittsburgh um, told us that they were having trouble um, getting people, getting their employees to complete um, health risk assessments and asked for our help. And they were paying $25 to employees who completed an HRA and they were willing to go up to $50. So what we did was we gave everyone the original $25 cash incentive for completing the HRA and there was a control um, group that got um, no extra reward. And then there was a direct payment group where we gave them a $25 grocery gift certificate. So effectively, we doubled, everyone shops for groceries, effectively, we doubled their monetary reward. And then we introduced a lottery condition, which is one of these kind of behavioral economics um, interventions that plays on biases. <coughs> We divided um, employees into groups of four to eight. Each week, one group from each work site was randomly selected. And individuals in the group, um, in the selected group, who had completed an HRA won $100. And individuals in the group who hadn't completed the HRA knew that the other people in the group had, um, had completed HRAs and received $100 and that they'd missed out on $100. Um, and we increased the prize to $125 if 80% of the work group had completed the HRA. You can see we're playing on group pressure, we're playing on regret, and uh, we're playing on people's love of lotteries and so on. A really um, an important feature of this is that the lottery intervention, the expected value of it was $25. So we, e we can either give people $25 or we can give people $25 in a different way. And here are the results. The con uh, here's the control condition that got $25. This is the um, condition where they got $25 and the $25 grocery certificate if they completed the HRA. And the lottery condition was much higher. Actually, the lottery, this is a very, very conservative estimate of the impact of the lottery condition. A bunch of people couldn't actually um, sign up for the lottery for com complex reasons, and this is based on intention to treat. And another feature of this is we looked at um, income. We looked at the impact of these interventions as a function of income. We just did a median split on the population and looked at low-income people who tended to be like um, support staff and higher-income people. And the, if you look at the impact among the high-income people, the lottery was a little bit more effective, but not that much more effective. But it was, the lottery was especially effective among the low-income groups. And very often, as we discussed um, earlier, very often low-income people are exactly the people you want to target with these types of interventions because they tend to have poorer health and poorer health behaviors. Another study um, we did now a, wh a ways um, back, this is applying behavioral economics to weight loss. Again, it exploited decision errors to help people. Um, this is a, in the first study we ran on weight loss, it was a three condition randomized controlled trial. There were three conditions, a control condition where they went to a dietitian for an hour long session. And there were two incentive conditions, a lottery condition and a deposit contract condition. 
at the start. Um, subjects were um, obese, vet, they were all veterans, they were almost, almost all of them were male. They were, I, I, I told you about the, they all received the one hour consultation. They were given the goal, everyone was given the goal of losing four pounds for, per month for four months. At the end of each month, they came into the lab and we, they were weighed on our clinic scale. And in the two incentive conditions, they were given a scale to take home. In the incentive conditions, they were asked to phone in their daily weight, and we sent them a daily text message. Um, so we're trying to give them a lot of, um, we're trying to give them frequent feedback um, consistent with present bias. And they receive their, um, and they also, the text message, um, if they get rewards, it tells them how much they've received. At the end of the month, when they come into the clinic, they actually get the money. So in effect, we're, it's almost like we're paying them twice. We're telling, every day we're telling them how much money they've earned, so we're giving them kind of a symbolic reward, and at the end of the month, they're getting the actual reward. So it's almost like the money is doing double duty. So here's somebody, um, a veteran who starts out at 250 pounds, and their goal is to lose 16 pounds in 16 weeks in this program. And if they stay under this line, then they get the rewards. Suppose that they don't, suppose that they don't stay under the line, what do we do? Well, one thing we could have done is we could have just shifted the line out here, parallel line like this, and they can just start again. We didn't want to do that because that would provide them with no, that would kind of give them an incentive to procrastinate. Like this month I won't lose weight, and then next month I'm going to start the program. Another thing we could have done was just kept this line where it is, but then take somebody who's here, after a month they haven't lost any weight, and now they have to lose four pounds to get under the green line, they'd probably give up at a certain point. And so this was kind of a compromise where there's an, a fresh start trajectory, but it's steeper. They have to lose more, they have to lose more weight each, they have to lose more weight um, each day to stay under the line. This is like typical kind of design consideration that goes into these types of programs. A lot of, some of it is science, a lot of it is just like brainstorming and trying to solve problems. Okay, in the lottery incentive, the subject chose a two-digit number, for example, 27. And every day, we drew a two-digit number. If the first two digits matched, like we drew a 25, or if the second digits matched, we drew a 57, then they won $10. If both digits match, so it's a one, a, about a, almost a one in five chance of winning $10, $2 expected value. If both digits match, uh, they win $100 and it's a one in a hundred ch chance of winning a hundred dollars. So the total expected value of the gamble is three dollars a day. Um, but um, they only got their money, they only er got their winnings if they called in that day and if they called in their weight and reported their weight being below the goal. And by the way, if they came in at the end of the month and their weight wasn't what it was um, reported to be, then they didn't get any of their winnings, of course. And so we, every day we transmitted a text message to the, to the subject telling them whether they won or whether they would have won if they had, um, if they had met their goal. So like uh, today, you, you won $10 today, but too bad you didn't call in your weight or unfortunately you were above your traject weight loss trajectory so you don't get the $10. So we're playing on regret. So I've already said the, the lottery incentive condition plays on regret and it also plays on nonlinear probability weighting on people's love of lotteries. People love lotteries, so let's give them lottery rewards. Okay, in the deposit contract incentive condition, subjects were uh, allowed to, um, at the beginning of each month, they could put down their own money from a penny a day to $3 a day toward weight loss and we matched each of their deposits one to one, plus we gave them a $3 daily payment. Of course, all of these rewards are contingent on them staying below their weight loss trajectory. Um, if they go above the weight loss traje trajectory, then they lose, they don't get our money, and they lose their own money. That's why it's called a deposit contract. And the deposit contract um, condition plays on over-optimism People are notoriously over-optimistic about their ability to exercise all types of self-control, including losing weight. And so people think, oh, I am going to lose four pounds this month. 
And based on that, they're ready to put down a big deposit. And then, um, due to a phenomenon that behavioral economists call loss aversion, people hate losing money. They don't want to lose the money that they put down. And so it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, self-fulfilling over optimism. Here are the results. Um, this is the um, total weight loss, um, again, intention to treat um, by condition. And you can see that the lottery and the deposit contract were both very um, effective. And we, we asked them, of course, a bunch of questions, and including um, did they change their diet? Did they um, change their exercise? They, um, we, they, we didn't see any relationship between losing weight and diet, but we saw a big relationship between losing weight and exercise. Now, this is, I've told you the good news about the study. The bad news is that we followed them up seven months later, and after seven months, not only had they not l continued to lose weight, but they gained back most of the weight that they lost. Um, so based on the fact that they regained their weight, we wondered, like, can a similar but less expensive approach be applied to extended weight loss? Again, deposit contracts, no longer a fixed payment of $3, just a, a, a match, a pure, a pure match. And once again, we found that the program was very successful in getting people to lose weight and keep the weight off for, for eight months instead of four months. But once again, really bad news. When we followed them up at 17 months, they had regained pretty much all of the weight that they had lost. Another program um, that we did, and I'm going to end in seven minutes because I want to have an extended discussion. Another program that we did involved um, incentives for medication adherence using daily lotteries. This was done with um, Warfarin. It's an anti-stroke medication with unambiguous benefits, but non-adherence rates are high. And Warfarin's a very, de um, you're probably, a lot of you are probably doctors, so I shouldn't even be telling you this, but Warfarin's a very dangerous um, drug. If you take too much of it, you can um, bleed internally, die from internal bleeding. And so a lot of doctors are afraid of, um, of prescribing warfarin to their patients because e even though it's very, very beneficial because it's so dangerous, because adherence is so poor. So we designed an intervention to get people to take their warfarin and you know, the right amount of time, not too much, not too little. And again, it's exactly the same lottery that I told you about before. And we, again, we play on regret. We, um, we tell them about their winnings. Um, and we tell them if they won, but they didn't take their warfarin, then we say, oh, too bad. You won the lottery. But because you didn't take your warfarin, you don't get paid. Now, hopefully, if you haven't already seen this, you're wondering, how did we know whether they took their warfarin? And the answer is with this by now a very old-fashioned piece of technology because the, the technology is developing incredibly quickly now. Uh, but this is an old piece of technology called a MEDI monitor, um, which communicates it by telephone. It communicates with the patients. And also, when it's got these little pill compartments. And when the patient opens up the compartment, it sends us a message. So we know at least, we don't know whether they took their warfarin, but we know whether they opened the compartment. And most people who are taking warfarin are pretty motivated to take it. I mean, if you've had a stroke, 50, about a 15% chance that you're going to have another stroke in the next year if you don't treat it, you can reduce that to about 3% if you take your warfarin. Most people don't want to have a stroke, and so on. So rates of non-adherence to warfarin were reduced with um, these lottery-based um, incentives quite um, dramatically. These are um, the INR rates, people being properly coagulated. You can see that they were um, out, not properly coagulated before the treatment, much, much better during the treatment. And, but once again, same message, as the, same message as for the weight loss. As soon as we removed the incentives, they went back to their old poor rates of adherence. So in my opinion, all of this, yes. This is, sorry, these are the blood tests. Okay, yeah, I should, have, I, I should have clarified this. So these are, the, um, this, these are the data from the Medi monitor, and these are the data from the blood tests. 
So um, in my opinion, a really big issue for these types of interventions are, is habit formation. So for something like the HRA completion, a one-shot thing or a flu shot or something like that, these types of interventions seem to work really, really well. They also work pretty well for more difficult behaviors like weight loss and medication adherence, but there's a big problem that as soon as the incentive, for ongoing behavior change, as soon as the incentives are removed, um, so far we haven't been able to develop habits. We're doing a bunch of research to try to fix that um, problem. So in some, uh, premium adjustments for health um, behavior are coming. They're part of the health care reform. Their pitfalls are clear. That is, they're going to introduce um, greater regressivity. The poor people who can least afford to pay more for health care are going to be paying more for health care. And it would be a tragedy if they don't also have their intended effect, which is to change behavior. Interventions based on behavioral economics have been successful in changing behavior, and these ideas can be used to ensure that the incentives um, for healthy behavior introduced by health care reform will actually have their intended impact. Yes. 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 Which is probably unique in the United States. I doubt that there's anywhere else in the world that you have as much of a business model in healthcare as you have. Yeah, you have a, yeah, there are a variety of different models in different countries. But and I, I'm just wondering how yes. much that yeah. profit aspect contributes yeah. to this. Yeah. Well, it, your question really worries me because um, the, you, you began with something that's exactly the um, opposite of the point I was trying to make. In my, in, in my opinion, all of the, um, t the really effective ways of cutting costs are exa exactly deal with the business model. They, they deal with the way that we ad um, administer health care in this country. And I don't think that the answer to the health care cost problem is to change behavior. All I was saying was that, of course, changing health behavior is a, a, good, a valid goal. It could reduce costs. All I'm saying is that the Safeway Amendment is going to have negative consequences that many people would view as negative. It's going to increase regressivity. And it, it's quite likely the way it's going to be, um, very likely going to be in introduced that it's not going to have any compensating benefits. And that we need to think carefully about how the incentives are introduced so that it does have compensating benefits. But I very much think that changing healthcare behaviors is not the way to reduce healthcare costs in this country. And that was the point of this slide. I mean, I think it will help, but there are other, um, that's not where the action is, really. That, that's kind of what I suspect, but the one bullet that, that is missing from there, unless it's kind of reading between the lines, is the actual uh, profit model oh. of uh, large conglomerates. Yes. 
Yes. Set standards for, you know, 10 minutes per patient. Right. And so on. I would say I was intending these to cover exactly the point that you're making. So I do think a difference in business model would affect all of these three points. Michael. When I told my mother, my mother asked me about what the research I do, and um, when I told her about it, um, her reaction was, you're paying people for doing what they should be doing on their own? <laughs> like, um, she was kind of horrified. And I, I, I have to admit that a part of me shares the um, reservations. Uh, and I don't think we want, to, we, we don't want a Walden II society where we're um, paying people for doing the things that are good for them. And um, so I think, um, first, there are a lot of incentives built into any, inevitably there are going to be incentives built into any plan. And if they are built in, we might as well implement them in a way that they're going to help. I don't think we want to move to a society where we're incentivizing people to do all sorts of different things. We don't even know what's going to, forget about the ethics, we don't even know what's going to, whether it's going to be effective. We, all of these experiments focus on one behavior. We have no idea what would happen if we incentivized multiple behaviors. So I, sh I share those psychologists or clinicians' reservations and my mother's um, reservations. And on the other hand, take something like, again, um, Higgins, a psychologist who does a lot of this work, but um, he's done um, a bunch of work um, targeting pregnant teenagers who smoke and incentivizing them to not smoke. Now that, to me, seems pretty non-controversial. It's very, very effective. Other, other types of approaches haven't been proven to be effective. So I think targeted incentives, targeted to the right people in the right circumstances, um, can be desirable and beneficial. But I share, I, I share these ethical qualms that you're mentioning. Richard? Yes. And the question is, what is the cost of The other, the, al the other alternative, uh, if you is the Bates um, and Madri and Choi uh, use of the pulse, mm -hmm. which was enormously effective in reducing uh, uh, patients of four hundred one k's, where people were leaving mm -hmm. matches yes. on the on the table right. on the yeah. floor. They were Yes. Pulled out some stuff, uh, out, out they match, and, 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 and had uh, 10, 15 percent of the way. Right. Certainly, I mean, certainly there's a lot of low hanging fruit when it comes to defaults and other kinds of nudges that don't cost anything. Mm -hmm. And we should go as far as we can with those, in my opinion. But take something like warfarin adherence. I'm not exactly sure how you default somebody to take the correct amount of warfarin. And so those are situations where you might need other types of interventions like and possibly incentive-based interventions. In our research, we have attempted to like take the warfarin case. Before we, why, how do we choose $3 expected value a day? We did a pretty casual um, estimation of what, how much would it save an insurance company to get somebody from not, who was non-adherent to warfarin to become mm -hmm. adherent. So 
and it was so the three dollars a day is very a very conservative estimate. Now some of these other take, take the health care reform. That's not that doesn't really cost anything. That's simply getting people with poor health behaviors to pay more and people with good health behaviors to pay less. So that we don't really have to worry about the cost effectiveness there. All we really have to worry about is effectiveness. So where, where would you see the field going in five years? The whole, f the whole field? <laughs> uh, I, behavioral I, economic approach to judging people I mean, I, th I think there's going to continue to be um, research on use of defaults and, nud and nudges. I think we still have further to go. We, we just did a program, um, a collaboration with um, CVS, where we got people to, using um, defaults, we actually not using defaults, but um, using kind of forced choice, forcing people to make a choice. We got a huge increase in people doing mail order o over um, going to the pharmacy. So I think there still is a big scope um, for that. But I think the, short, the big short-term issue is the issue that I raised. How can we inculcate um, habits? Because we don't want to be introducing long-term in incentives for too many behaviors. Yes? Well, this is, that was a one-shot. I'm completing the HRAs. But I'm, I'm really glad that you raised that because it actually um, gives me a better answer to um, Dr. Sussman's um, question. And that is, um, so far, we, um, <clears throat> we've mainly been doing kind of individualistic rewards. But I completely agree with you that a really important um, new area for research, both with incentives and without incentives, is kind of group group rewards, group pressure, and so on. We just did a intervention, hopefully it's about to get accepted for pu publication, with um, diabetes patients where we compared monetary reward program to a peer mentor program. And the peer mentor program, so we took somebody who had, ha um, had out, um, out of control um, diabetes and they had gotten it under control and they were the mentor and they worked with somebody who hadn't con didn't have it under control. And the peer mentor program was extremely effective and more effective than the incentive program. So I completely agree with you that um, groups, dyads, and so on is a really important new area with and without incentives. And that's another area we should be going on, um, into in the future. Yes? I mean, the insurance companies are enormously interested in this. And, and we're working with a, a range of insurance companies to test inter, um, interventions like this with their populations. Also, we're doing this work with CVS, ph um, pharmacy benefits manager. So there's enormous commercial interest. Now, maybe there's not as much interest as there um, could be. And, and the reason for that would be that um, in today's fragmented um, healthcare market, and this goes back to your point, where people are changing jobs and they're changing insurers all the time, a, an insurer who um, sp spends money to change an employee's health, beha um, health behavior is very likely to not actually capture the gains from the improvement in health. And so that's another di big disadvantage of the way that we do things now. 
But there is a huge interest among insurers, despite that fact, in these types of interventions. In the back. We are. We're, we're doing a lot of we're doing a lot of research on that, and that um, is more in progress. So that's why I didn't um, talk about it. But I, I agree, it's a very very important um, area, and the um, a specific one focus in that research is on the impact of um, limiting conflicts of interest. What's the impact of reducing conflicts of interest on physician behavior, but also we're looking at the impact of, like for example, in diabetes management, we're comparing the impact of incentivizing patients, inf incentivizing physicians, incentivizing both or neither. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. That's a really another, th you're all giving me good responses to um, <laughs> Dr. Sussman's um, question. That's another really important area of future research. Yes. Oh, sure. Okay. I mean, I'm, tr um, I'm trying to be very direct with you about the, you know, the good things and the bad things. Like, um, but let me, let me nevertheless, first, there's a lot of things in healthcare that are one shot, like um, uh, vaccinations um, and completing HRAs and so on. And so, and the, these approaches are very effective for those. Second, all of our interventions have been pr persistently effective as long as we've kept the incentives going. And some of them are quite cost effective. So you could say, fine, let's just, ki let's, where it's really important, let's just keep the incentives going as long as we want to change the behavior. You're right. The, the, we the weak point is that um, we don't yet know how to d develop programs where when we remove the incentives, the behavior persists. No, but we, um, we, they, well, we have the four months versus eight months of weight loss. And also, I think um, these incentives are really designed to have a persistent effect because they're very, they involve a lot of interaction between the clinician and the patient. The, clini the patient keeps putting the money down or the, um, keeps getting these um, messages, you, you know, you won $100 today, but you don't get it, and so on. And those are pretty compelling messages. And That's right. I and mean, we don't have evidence beyond eight months, but we, we're pretty optimistic on that point. Yes? Yes. Well, there, um, there is some research going on. I, I, I'm not at all an expert on research funding and things like that, but I, th I think there is a lot of research going on in Medicare, Medicaid, um, trying to test 
trying to do field studies to test the impact of these types of interventions. Um, and most of these studies that I'm showing you are kind of field, they're field studies, you know, real people in real situations. We, there are some methods that we can employ, you know, kind of interrupted, crude interrupted time series to see if these measures have an impact. But so many things are going to be changing at the same time that you're right. We're not going to really know exactly what, if, if we get changes in behaviors, we're not going to know exactly what drives them. But let me say that I do think that the, a lot of the pieces of the Healthcare Reform Act are not evidence-based. So the calorie posting, like um, maybe people, people, perhaps you could argue, people deserve to have the um, information when they make choi food choices. They just deserve, it's an inherent good to have the information th up there so you know what you're, how many calories you're taking in. But there's no evidence that that's going to have any positive impact on behavior. Th same thing with VBED, same thing as you, my whole talk was about, same thing with the contingent insurance premiums. We have no, we have no evidence that that's actually going to have a beneficial effect. So pretty much all of the pieces of the Healthcare Reform Act that are designed to change um, health behaviors are not evidence-based. And you're right, we're not going to get data when the, when the act is implemented. We're going to not get very usable information about what the impacts are. That's why we need to do um, more research um, of this type. Pitch, okay. <laughs> and, and, um, okay, let me. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, something I didn't really go into any detail about on the warfarin was we accidentally implemented the incentives wrong the first time we did it. It was um, five dollars. It was five dollars a day instead of three dollars a day, which is what we intended. And five dollars a day was very effective. But then we started over again. We we con we continued those people, but we started over again with a new group, three dollars a day. And if anything. Certainly, there's no significant difference, but $3 a day was just as effective as five. What if we did $3 a day is what we think is almost certainly cost effective. But what if we went down? Put up your next slide. OK. When, if, you look, if you look at the blood, if you look, if you look at the, yeah, that's right. That's right. The um, $3, the $5 looks proportionately more successful. But th this is a small, this is a small study. I would not, um, th but the point is we don't really know how low we can go. Three dollars is already, I, so I completely agree with your question of course, but three dollars is probably already cost effective, but it might be that a program involving a dollar a day would also be effective and then it would be way more cost effective. Yes. I agree that that would be a, that would be a great um, direction to go, and and we are doing some interventions 
to try to develop habits that do play on psychology, but not exactly what you are <laughs> talking about. Back to you. We haven't. There's a website called stick.com, and they, they use that. They use that. On the other hand, but I think, well, they don't have any data because it's just a commercial website. But they, um, I think so, uh, those types of ideas might be um, very promising, but you would certainly want to combine them with some of the ideas in, in our work, like, for example, the the daily deposit, things like that. Um, I think some of these programs where you put a lot of money down and then you have a long-term goal are much less likely to be effective than the t types of programs that we do that where you get daily feedback, which is I think is really important. I wouldn't underestimate the power of things. <laughs> Perhaps, <laughs> yeah. Yes. We, we, um, we did the only study that I know of on this, and I've, of, I've often heard that claim, but I think that we did the only study, anyway, we did the only study that I know of on, exactly on this. We went to New York City before they introduced calorie posting in fast food restaurants, and we collected meal receipts. And then, and even during that time, we randomly assigned people to get no contextual information to get um, this is how many calories you should eat per day. This is how many calories you should eat for lunch. It was lunch. Um, so very, very target, you know, targeted contextual information. We went back after calorie posting a month later, and we had the same three groups. And the, giving them the calorie, the contextual information had no beneficial effect. Even the daily, you, you'd think, I mean, we, we expected that it would. Because you're going in, you're seeing the calorie information, and you're seeing this is how many calories you should eat for lunch. So you can directly compare the two. Daily, it's much more difficult. But we, um, it had no impact. Yeah, so, so I know some other okay. research on that. Okay, I'd like to, I'd like to see then, that. That's right, that's which is, but yeah. Another focus is not only on individual behavior, but also on the way of people in relation to the industry. Oh, yeah. That's a great, yeah, that's a great point. I, I think that um, I'm not as, pe I, I'm very pessimistic that if you take a person who goes into McDonald's before and after calorie posting, that they're going to eat, have, eat it, order a different meal. Maybe some people will, but it's probably not the people who we care about. Yeah. And I'm a little bit more optimistic about the idea that maybe a few people will not go to McDonald's and maybe go to Subway or something like that. Or that maybe yeah. Or well, yeah, let me, yeah, and that's the third point. I think the, bi the, the biggest um, area where this might have a benefit is if McDonald's, it's kind of a telltale heart effect, McDonald's and Subway get, um, are worried, you know, oh, the information's out in it there now, we have to change our menu. And generally, um, I've done a lot of research on disclosure, and the reading that I've done, a disclosure of information, for example, disclosure of conflicts, conflicts of interest, um, most of the literature on disclosure shows that 
to the degree that disclosure has an effect, a benefit, and it often does have a benefit, it doesn't operate through the consumer. It operates through the retailer, the producer, and so on. And I think that's true here, too. If calorie posting has a benefit, almost for sure the biggest benefit will be if it changes the, um, what the, the offerings of the um, fast food restaurants. Yes? Yes. I, I totally agree with you that it's not just about the money, and it's not also it's not about only about the types of issues that I've discussed, but also it's about the symbolic value. And for example, who is who's giving you the money? If it's a health insurer, you might feel like they're just doing it for their benefit. It's not for me. But maybe if it's your employer, I even um, if it's your employer giving it to you, if you have a good relationship with your employer, maybe you're going to feel like, oh, they're doing it for me. They're not just doing it to save money. Who knows? But you're, the issue, once you start thinking about the this, this symbolic significance, then things like who does the money come from could potentially make a big difference. And so I agree. That's something that we really need to think carefully about, like um, how people, not only the incentive value, but how people interpret, like, what do, what's the meaning of the money? The, yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, giving people like um, thousands of points instead of yeah. It's certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, certainly a lot of um, retailers seem to believe that that is an effective strategy. I wonder whether its effectiveness might be lower now than it was when they started doing it. Because I think a lot of people are kind of cynical about points from their own experience with, you know, trying to redeem them. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, we've actually in a completely different um, line of research, we worked with a, a bank on loyalty programs, and the bank's um, customers were really frustrated by a, a, a program like that. We started sending them surprise gifts, and that had a huge impact on their um, happiness with the bank, their loyalty to the bank, and actually their deposits went up, whereas for the control group, they went down. So. I think that these kind of po loyalty programs and points and things like that, people are kind of burnt out on them. But so there might have been a time when that would be a good idea, but I think it might, just based on intuition, it may have passed. Um, you have to tell me when. Okay, um, Probably soon. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Or are they going to be no different from adults? Probably, well, first, 
Of course, incentives are used a lot with kids, and there's some, there's some um, very um, interesting studies um, involving um, paying kids for schoolwork, yeah, and, um, and it turns out that it's much better to pay the kid, uh, you might have been listening to NPR, um, what's the economist's name? Roland Fryer at Harvard, um, he's been doing these programs. He finds that if you pay the kids for reading a book, or for concrete behaviors, ch showing up at school, that's quite effective. If you pay them to get good grades, that has no impact at all. And so there are, certainly incentives can be very effective with kids. The, with children, you might want to, they, if you don't know how to get good grades, then you, it's better to incentivize the behaviors. Adults might have a better idea, like we incentivize people to lose weight. We didn't incentivize people to exercise or cut down on eating because we figured adults know how to lose weight and these things are difficult to measure. But um, my reading of the literature on incentives for kids is that it, it has exactly, it's confronting exactly the same issues of habit formation. And, but incentives certainly are very powerful for kids. I, I do think that there's been some work on crowding out of intrinsic motivation that if you pay, if you pay children to do things they won't be motivated to do them on their own. I, my own view is that um, that is kind of a bit overblown and that children, all of us, we love doing things that we're good at and we hate doing things that we're bad at. And so if you can get somebody, if you can pay somebody to do something to the point where they become comfortable with it, where they gain mastery, that can be a huge effect, very, very likely much, much more powerful effect than the crowding out of intrinsic motivation that's been shown in studies where everything else is held constant. Yes? Okay, um, maybe we should. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, I'll answer your question personally. Right. Okay, so okay. Um, please join me in thanking George for a great talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Did all...